Well, welcome everybody. It's nine o'clock, so let's get started. Um, I'm Bill Daly. I'm Chief Scientist of, of NVIDIA and Senior Vice President of, of NVIDIA Research um, and uh, sponsor of NTECH. Um, and I would uh, uh, like to take this time to uh, introduce our keynote speaker. It's my great pleasure um, to introduce Peter Stone. Peter is the David Brunton Jr. Centennial Professor at the University of Texas at Austin. And he is also the Chief Operating Officer of Kajitai his AI startup that's pioneering reinforcement learning and its applications to uh, um, industrial problems. He does research on AI and robotics. Um, he's a leader in this field, and particularly on, uh, on reinforcement learning. He received, uh, in 2007, the prestigious IJKAI Computers and Thought Award, one of the highest awards in AI. In his free time, he plays violin and soccer, and combining his interest in soccer with reinforcement learning, he has been known to field the winning uh, teams in the annual RoboCup soccer competition, both in the simulation league and in the live robot um, league. Um, he, his team has been dominating the 3D simulation league in uh, the tournament that was played this last July. Um, they won all 23 games that they played, and they scored 171 goals uh, without letting a single goal be scored on them. And so he will t t tell us the secret to that, that success. Peter? Thanks, Bill. Thanks, uh, everybody. It's a really, uh, real honor to be here um, at NVIDIA, and um, thanks to all of the all of the organizers. So I'm going to try to do a lot of different things in this uh, in this talk. Try to do something for everybody. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of an overview of what reinforcement learning is, sort of a little tutorial mode. Some of you may be familiar with that already, but for those of you who aren't, hopefully it'll give a little bit of a um, a hook to to latch onto when you hear this this term being being thrown around a little bit now. Then I'll go into more of my own um, research on reinforcement learning, multi-agent systems. Um, and, uh, and then at the end, I'm going to pop up a level and talk about just the big picture of artificial intelligence, which will hopefully lead into the question and answer session um, afterwards. So um, one goal, one long-term goal of artificial intelligence and robotics is to create robust, fully autonomous agents in the real world. This isn't the only goal of AI. There's, there's people who take different, different goals of, of uh, modeling, the, you know, modeling the human brain or working on a particular sub-problem or you know, uh, task. But I think um, myself and a, and a group of colleagues have really latched on to this idea of trying to, to, um, to create fully autonomous agents in the world. And then the question comes up is how, how should we go about doing that? At the beginning of the field 50, 60 years ago, there was no option. You had to start working on the subcomponents and say, let's work on, you know, some group work on vision, some group work on perception, on, on planning, some on action, maybe, and we'll hope we can put them together at the end. Um, but now there's, after, you know, a half a century of, of research, there is the opportunity to work from the other direction instead of the bottom up, to work from the top down by building complete agents to perform increasingly complex tasks. And so um, the research in my lab sort of does, uh, comes from both directions, but uh, I'm going to emphasize this more top-down approach today. And what I mean by complete agents, I mean agents that, um, that sense their environment, perception, uh, have some decision-making process, and then actually act in the world as well in a closed loop without any human intervention in between. So, um, so for instance, uh, Deep Blue, the chess playing program, that did one of these three things. It did the decision making, but, but there was no, it didn't have to sense the board itself. It didn't have to move the pieces itself. It was just working, you know, it was doing the, the, uh, the decision aspect. And so, um, and the idea of, of building these complete uh, agents, this sort of integration, top down approach, uh, is that it will drive research on components of, of uh, the algorithms and the theory and sort of motivate research on the, the bottom up, um, of the bottom up style as well. My own, um, my own focus, both for the tasks that I choose and the, the uh, core algorithms and theory that we develop in my lab, comes from um, the, the, un the understanding or realization that if, that if we're going to have complete agents that work in the real world, they're going to need to improve from experience, experience. If they make the same mistakes over and over again, you won't be calling them intelligence. If, if you have a, an autonomous car and it drives through the same pothole every day or something. So we need them to, to improve from experience, and that's the, the subfield of AI known as machine learning. And the other is that there's not just going to be a single autonomous agent in the world. They're going to need to interact with one another, and this uh, motivates the field of, of multi-agent systems. So you know, from, that, um, from that starting point, there's a whole bunch of different things that go on in my lab. 
and I'm not going to be able to tell you about any, uh, you know, any large majority of them today. I'm going to sort of focus in. But the, one, the question that connects all of them is the one here on the screen. It's to what degree can autonomous intelligent agents learn in the presence of teammates and or adversaries in real-time dynamic domains? And, um, and so within artificial intelligence, the sub-areas that, that, uh, that this brings me to, the sort of conferences that I publish in, uh, are autonomous agents, robotics, multi-agent systems, and the one I'm, I'm, I'm going to emphasize in this talk, especially machine learning, and the, the sub-area of, of machine learning known as reinforcement learning. Now, you know, I said I can't tell you everything that's going on in my lab. The, you know, there's a lot of sort of um, uh, individual algorithms but, um, that, that don't really fit on one slide. But it is uh, sort of the best way to get a sense of the problems that motivate me is to see the, the challenge problems that we work on in this sort of more top-down top uh, style. And so um, just to give you a sense, um, as Bill said in the introduction, I've been involved for many years in the, the uh, annual robot soccer competitions. These are our robots from about 10 years ago scoring a goal in one of the competitions where they have to do this sensing, deciding, and acting. There was nobody with a remote control controlling those robots. They're having to perceive through a camera in their head. Um, that was using the, the Sony Ibo robots, which was later discontinued, and so the league moved to uh, the uh, nows, uh, the humanoid robots. These are made by SoftBank. So ours, this is the final of the 2012 competition. Ours are the robots with their hands behind their backs. Um, this was the finals against the team from the University of Bremen in Germany that had won the competition the past few years. Um, we ended up winning this uh, Winning this game four to two, also let you see the first goal where our robot goes in on a breakaway here. Um, and you have to keep uh, keep in mind that while they're doing this again, there's no person with a remote control. They're doing this completely on their own. Um, and every year we make the challenge more difficult. So this year there was an orange ball. We've since moved to a black and white ball. Here you'll see the robot calmly bank the ball off the goalpost and uh, into the goal. So um, and uh, so these are the. You know, this is sort of one of those integrative challenges where you have to, the robots have to not just do the perception, they have to figure out where they are in the field, even though it's symmetric. They have to coordinate as a team. They have to, they have to move, walk. Um, they have to do, put all of these things together. And when we, um, we ended up winning that competition, we came back to the University of Texas and they lit the tower orange for us, which they usually only do when the football team wins. So um, that, was, that was nice. So, so robot soccer I'll talk more about in this talk. If you come to my lab um, at UT, uh, you don't need to ask us for a demo. You'll, more often than not, you'll see one of these robots just wandering through the hallway. Um, this is called as part of the Building Wide Intelligence Project. This video was from some joint research with a colleague of mine, Ray Mooney, where we were working on grounded language learning on this robot. Um, so in this video, and you don't have to understand the full details of it, um, this is the robot moving at four times speed, by the way. It doesn't move this fast through the, through the building. But, but this was where the, at the, we ran a week-long experiment where people would be able to type to the robot in natural language to ask it to do things for it, like bring it coffee or follow, lead me somewhere. And at the beginning, it didn't really understand the language very well, but at every dialogue that it went through, it would ask questions until it did understand, and then it could use the earlier sentences as training examples for the ultimate meaning and then using grounded language learning technology that, that Ray Mooney and his students have developed, by the end of the week, we were able to have shorter dialogues, higher success rate, and, and uh, more satisfied users as they were interacting with these robots. And so this is a platform that we use for many things now for um, activity recognition, multi-robot systems research. Um, the goal is to have these just be a, a part of the social fabric of the building. And if you come in, you can just expect to, um, to interact with these robots. I also had a car in the DARPA Urban Challenge. So um, this is, uh, um, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's try this again. Um, so I uh, sped up a little bit again, but this is our car in the back here. Um, I went here with a, with a team of uh, undergrads from UT. In this task, they had to, it had to make a left-hand turn across traffic. So there's nobody in our car, but there were uh, human-driven cars going along the inside loop. They had helmets on and roll bars. They looked sort of scared, but our car successfully, uh, successfully did eight loops in 20 minutes here in this, in this test. Um, we uh, then used this car for research for several years. I've now retired this car. It doesn't make sense for me as an individual uh, professor to, to have a, a prototype car when the industry is putting so much money into self-driving cars. But we're still thinking about what the world will look like when all the cars on the road are autonomous. And our view of that is, can be seen in this video, which we put out back in 2003 when most people looked at us like we were crazy when we said that, most, that we'd get to a point with autonomous cars on the road. 
Um, this is what I think intersections could look like. Rather than having stop signs or traffic signals, what's going on here is the cars in white have called ahead for a reservation at the intersection from an, inter from an intersection manager. The ones that are yellow don't have a reservation yet, but as soon as they get one, they have a guaranteed path through the intersection that won't collide with any of the other cars. Um, now, of course, this is, uh, you know, for dramatic effect, there's very small buffers around the cars. If we pretended the cars were twice as big, they wouldn't get as close to each other. And we've since done a lot of research on, well, what happens if some of the cars are driven by people? What kind of mechanisms can we use? What happens if we scale this up to, um, to full cities rather than individual intersections? This has led to, a, to an ongoing thread of research that um, I'm not really going to get into um, today. So that's sort of the one slide introduction of, of the problems that motivate me. Um, but now I'm going to, and, and, and really the, uh, you know, the thing that these problems have in common is that they're, they're great test beds for machine learning and especially reinforcement learning, which is the type of learning that's particularly appropriate for autonomous agents, and I'll talk about that um, in the next few slides, and also that they're really, uh, they're really fundamentally multi-agent systems. So what's reinforcement learning? So um, supervised learning has been, it, so most people who do machine learning in industry do what we call um, supervised learning. And supervised learning, you know, in, in one, um, in one uh, example is just um, the problem of trying to take in labeled training examples, such as this is a four, this is a three, this is a one, lots of other examples, including examples of eights, learning a function, and then a uh, predictive function, and then being given another training example and trying to, to predict the label. Okay, and this, is, this has sort of been the work, workhorse of, um, of machine learning for many years. There were publicly available packages like Weka available decades ago. Now there's, of course, many others. That, and deep learning is really you know, an example of, of uh, supervised learning that's really um, caught the world by storm. And NVIDIA has been, been really a big part of this story. Um, but for, uh, for autonomous agents, there's a different paradigm known as reinforcement learning that's, that's more appropriate. And there's basically two fundamental differences between supervised learning and reinforcement learning. Um, just to, to introduce the paradigm, it's rather than learning, this, learning a predictive function, the paradigm in reinforcement learning is that you have an agent that's operating in the world that's trying to learn a policy. And the policy is a function from the state of the environment to the action that the agent's going to take. And um, rather than is it learning this function, rather than getting labeled examples, it has to learn from its own experience. So it has to execute the, its current policy, which, which leads it to output and action. When it does that, the environment will send back the result of that action. So for instance, you know, if, a, if a car decides to turn right, well then it'll turn right, it'll get to a, new, um, to a new intersection, it'll have a new perception that's coming from the environment. And it may, there may also be a reward signal, like how long it took to get there. And so the difference between this paradigm and that, there, or the two differences are, first of all, there's, no, there's uh, what's known as delayed reward, or the credit assignment problem. You have to take a sequence of decisions before you find out what happened, which were the good decisions. So if you, if you play a game of chess, for instance, you, you make a move, and unless you have a, you know, a grandmaster as a tutor standing behind your shoulder, nobody tells you that was a good move or a bad move. Instead, you have to take a move, wait, your opponent moves, you take a whole sequence at the end, you find out if you won or lost, and then you have to go back and say, what was the move that, that won the game for me or lost the game for me? That's the credit assignment problem. And this comes up in any sequential decision-making problem, right? If you drive to work, you make a series of decisions. And the decision you make, um, you know, it's not the last decision that determines how long it took you. It might have been the first decision. So that's one, the credit assignment problem. And the other fundamental difference is that the data set isn't given to you ahead of time. So in supervised learning, you've got these labeled examples. You process it, and then you have this new function. In reinforcement learning, the agent itself is responsible for generating its own data. The algorithm has to do that. So if you play the same chess opening every time, you'll never learn anything about what would have happened if you'd taken a different move as your first move. And if you drive the same way to work every time, same thing. So there's a tension between exploiting what you already know or exploring to get new information. And so that's the, uh, the exploration exploitation problem. So reinforcement learning algorithms are the collection of algorithms that address reinforcement learning problems. And reinforcement learning problems are the problems that exhibit these characteristics. Sequential decision making with delayed reward and the need to do exploration versus exploitation. So in its neatest form, or you know, in, in the sort of, uh, from a theoretical perspective, you can model reinforcement learning as a Markov decision process. So canonically, a Markov decision process 
um, is you know, a sequence of states. So you can think of these as the, the possible chessboard positions or the possible places your car could be. From each of those states, there's some actions that you can select. So you know, some, some uh, set of actions. For each of those actions, there's probabilistic transitions. So if you take this, this transition, uh, this action, it might take you to the same state. It might move you to another state. Um, and then along some of these transitions, there may be reward signals. And those are the components of an MDP. To solve an MDP is to find the optimal policy, the one that will lead you to the highest reward in the long run. So it might mean taking an action that gives you a negative reward now if it gets you to a state where you can get positive reward in the, in the future. And reinforcement learning was sort of invigorated back in the 1980s, late 1980s, early 1990s, when there were some really beautiful uh, foundational theoretical results that you could find the globally optimal policy using a very simple algorithm. So you could solve the MDP and find the optimal policy for the agent um, using, uh, using some very straightforward uh, algorithms. But the problem is they, um, they made some assumptions, like you know, that there's a small finite number of states, that there's a discrete set of actions, that you can visit every state um, infinitely often, which in practice is never possible. Right? And so to, to make applications of reinforcement learning practical, we need to have innovations. And so a lot of the research in my, my lab is focused on how can we scale up reinforcement learning being motivated by those um, theoretical results. So the, the real sort of landmark result that, that, that got the field going was known as, uh, was due to Watkins in his thesis in 89, and it was that a, a simple algorithm known as Q learning does converge to the optimal policy, not a local optimum, the globally op optimal policy, and it does so by using an intermediate data structure known as a value function. So a value function is a mapping from the state action pair, so it's like if, you, if you're in this state and you took this action, it gives you a value for that action that represents the maximum reward you could get if you acted optimally afterwards. Okay, so if you can learn this value function, it's trivial to act optimally. You just, in any, any state, you look up the, um, you know, the, all the actions you could take, which has the highest value, and you execute it. You can sort of basically be myopic. It's the value function that encodes the credit assignment. And it turns out that you can, that Q-learning is a simple algorithm that just takes your current state, um, or the, you know, your past state, your past action, your current state, and the last reward does an incremental stochastic gradient descent kind of update to this value function and does, using sort of a fixed point theorem kind of pro proof, converge to the globally optimal policy. Um, the problems are, as I, said, as I foreshadowed, it's that you need a table-based representation, meaning that you have to have a, you know, a finite um, set of states and actions, and you have to be able to visit every state infinitely often for the proof to go through. So that leads then to the need to, to the idea of using function approximation. Rather than, um, motive, rather than representing the, the discrete values of every state action pair, let's instead um, fit a continuous function over this value function. And this now actually embeds a supervised learning problem inside of reinforcement learning. The supervised learning problem is if you were in this state and, this, and you took this action, what values should you get? That becomes a data point in a supervised learning problem, and then you can use any kind of, um, any kind of supervised learning algorithm, including uh, a neural network, or, you know, deep, uh, deep learning, or um, there's many others. There's, there's CMAX, or there's decision trees. There's many different ways you can uh, do this supervised learning problem um, that allows you to generalize over these state action pairs, and now you can apply to, to larger scale problems, but the theoretical guarantees become a lot harder to come by. There are actually some uh, optimality convergence proofs with certain types of function approximators, but typically averagers, not ones as complex as, as neural networks. The other um, sort of high level key innovation was, was to rather than um, doing these just incremental updates of taking an action from a particular state, doing one update to the value function, and then throwing away the data. Um, instead, if you save those transitions, remember all of the past history, you can be more efficient by doing batch, batch updates and trying to fit this value function, not just to your last experience, but to all of the experiences you've had in the past. And so that's another way that you can, um, can scale up or make more sample efficient, more, you know, allow these algorithms to learn from less, uh, less data. So, so those are, that's sort of, in a nutshell, that's what reinforcement learning is. That, that's how it works. That's what people mean when, they, when they, uh, they talk about reinforcement learning. For the, you know, most of the 20 years or 25 years I've been working on this, um, 
reinforcement learning was sort of a niche community within machine learning, and certainly outside of AI, nobody knew what it, what it was. But it, as you know, in the last three or four years, it's really become a buzzword. Um, but I think you know, many people don't understand the distinction between supervised learning and reinforcement learning. So hopefully this gives you, a, you know, something to, to latch on to as, um, as you hear those terms. Now, as this, is, this is sort of the theoretical uh, presentation. But, and and you know, people often would say, well, you know, yes, that's great in theory, but what has it done? What kind of problems has it solved? There's actually been, over the years, many, um, many things that reinforcement learning has done. One of the most famous is back in uh, 1994, there was a, um, a backgammon program played, trained exactly through Q-learning, just through lots of data using a neural network function approximator um, that, beat, uh, that, that got to human level championship play at backgammon. Um, there's been uh, some uh, reinforcement learning for helicopter control. Um, and then more recently, some really nice uh, applications. Joel Pino at, uh, at McGill has shown for uh, the, um, success in adaptive treatment of, of epilepsy, where the, you have to set, figure out what are the, the sequence of electrical impulses to give to, uh, to, a, to uh, the brain to, to be able to control, um, to be able to control the, the, uh, the symptoms. Um, Diederich, uh, Tom Diederich has worked on some sustainability applications like invasive species management and wildfire suppression. And of course, the most famous one most recently uh, with Google DeepMind beating the human Go champion um, just last year. And this was Im embedded in this was, was really a reinforcement learning um, algorithm. But really fundamentally no different than what I showed you in the previous slides. In my lab, we've worked on scaling up reinforcement learning in many different directions. And so I'll give you sort of the one slide sort of survey of some of those techniques. And then I'm going to dive in onto to one in particular. But we've looked at human, uh, human interaction, so um, learning from uh, demonstrations. So in, in this kind of a, um, don't need the sound on this. Um, the, uh, in this uh, application, we had basically a person, um, and I'll speed it up a little bit. Um, in a bodysuit and the robot mimicking that person, and then the, the, uh, the person could demonstrate different behaviors that the robot could then um, figure out what to do. So here's the, the person uh, puppeteering, basically, the robot to move the car from one place to another. The robot can capture that sequence of, of state action pairs and then use it to do its own self-learning afterwards. Um, we've also uh, done a bunch of, of research on learning from positive and negative feedback. So in the game of Tetris, um, using standard reinforcement learning, you can learn to, to play the game of Tetris after you know, hundreds of thousands of games, you can get a really good policy. In this research, we had just a person saying good move or bad move after every move. So red meant bad move, green meant good move. And in this, uh, even in this first episode, it was starting from random, it, starts, it makes some bad moves at the beginning. Um, but if I, I'll, maybe I'll speed it up again also a little bit. It starts making some more reasonable moves even in this first episode. Um, and then if we jump ahead to, the, to th just three episodes in, it's, it's already learned a policy that can clear hundreds of lines. Right? So by leveraging this, um, this positive and negative feedback from a person and adapting the reinforcement learning paradigm, we were able to speed up reinforcement learning dramatically. Um, and then my student, Brad Knox, applied this for robot training as well. Um, We've also done work on transfer learning and reinforcement learning. So this is the, you know, the idea of um, you can teach a person. If you're teaching a kid to play chess, you might want to teach them checkers first or tic-tac-toe first to learn some basic concepts. There's algorithms to allow uh, reinforcement learning algorithms to leverage different tasks to, to, uh, to then speed up learning on, on later, more complicated tasks. Um, we've worked on different uh, adaptive and hierarchical representations for reinforcement learning. And then uh, on our autonomous car, we introduced an algorithm called Texplore that's both sample efficient, work in real time, state, and delayed effects. And we applied it to our autonomous car doing a speed control task, where here we didn't tell the car initially what would happen if it presses the accelerator or the brakes. It had to explore that on its own. And in two and a half minutes of training on the car without any having to pause and, and doing computation in the background, it, got, it um, was able to maintain its, uh, a target velocity of 30 miles an hour um, as well as we could with a finely hand-tuned PID controller. And so just through, through experience, we, it's, it was able to learn this. And so this Texplore algorithm was really a, a de designed for reinforcement learning on, um, on real robots. So that's, the, um, that's sort of the survey of kinds of reinforcement learning uh, algorithms that, that we've looked at in my lab. I'm now going to dive into um, 
to robot soccer as an application. Um, in particular, the theme of learning a controller, um, starting from the real world, the real robots that I showed you at the beginning playing soccer, taking that into simulation, learning and applying that in simulation for a particular purpose, and then going back to the real world afterwards. And that's sort of going to be the, the thread for the rest of this talk is, um, is uh, from the real world to simulation and back. So RoboCup soccer is the domain. The grand challenge here is by the year uh, 2050 to beat the World Cup champions on a real soccer field. We're a little bit far away from that. If you, you know, the, the robots that you saw earlier on are not really going to challenge the professional soccer players. Um, so we're you know, still in the relatively early stages, um, but there's still more than 30 years to go. So you know, who knows? Maybe it's still possible. Um, but as a challenge problem, it has, it has many virtues. So there's, um, it does follow this sort of complete, uh, complete problem paradigm that you have to, you can create increasingly difficult problems, make, you know, sort of uh, raise the bar from year to year, um, making it more difficult, but at all periods return, requiring sensation, um, cognition, and action in a closed loop. And so that's the way it's worked. It's good for multi-robot systems. There's, it's relatively easy entry, so it's been inspiring to very many people around the world. We get at every uh, competition, there's typically two to 3,000 researchers who come and, uh, and compete in one of the various leagues. There are different leagues that each have different challenges. I tend to participate in the ones where um, I, I participate in the standard platform league where everyone has the same hardware, so it's a more of a computer science challenge than uh, some of the other leagues where you have to build your own robots, and the simulation league, which also has that same characteristic. Um, but in all of these leagues, the robots are all fully autonomous. This is what it looked like when we started back in 97 or 98, and it's actually painful to watch for me a little bit because um, the robots are falling over, they're running into walls, and like over here they just sort of crash into things. Um, when they fall over, they do get, you know, they eventually do get up. That one, you know, crashed into the wall. They're moving slowly. But, event, you know, eventually goals are scored. So here's a, you know, there's not much resistance from any goalkeeper here. But the ball went into the goal. So that's good. And you have to appreciate that back in 1997, just getting robots, 30 or 40 robots in the same room all working was a huge accomplishment. Most people who called themselves roboticists didn't actually have robots. Right? They worked on a sub-problem. And, you know, to, to have access to a robot, you had to be at one of the top graduate schools in the, you know, in the, in the world. Um, so this was just, you know, the, where we started. And then if you go 10 years from, jump 10 years uh, into the future with many of these same leagues, there was a big improvement, right? So now you're starting to see faster moving robots. Um, you're starting to see passing. You're starting to see the beginning of the humanoid league. So they just had a penalty shot competition that year. Um, there was not, uh, now there's full games in the humanoid league as well. Um, and even there, you know, you'd get some, there'd be some goals scored. I think, you know, here the, the goalie uh, made a valiant effort. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you yeah, know, so th there was progress. And every year we go back to RoboCup, and at least one of these leagues, there's some progress, both from the level, in the level of play and in the challenges. So now there's, there's no longer the yellow goals. They had the, the perception problem has become more difficult. They use black and white balls instead of the orange. The field gets bigger. There's more robots. There's always um, new challenges added. And the idea is, you know, the sort of mantra of this, this whole endeavor is that good problems produce good science. And, of course, that's not the only, you know, it's not just in computer science that that's the case. That's been true in many, um, many uh, areas of science. But there have been, you know, and, and uh, it's a lot of fun trying to get robots to, to play soccer. But, of course, you know, the goal is not... That, that's not going to make the world a better place if we have robots that can beat the World Cup champions. But to get there, it's really driving research in a whole bunch of areas. And that's the whole point here. There's um, you know, people who come from many different fields to participate in these. For me, it's a great domain because of the last line here, the, the multi-agent systems, machine learning, and robotics challenges. There's been lots of publications and PhD theses coming out of this, this whole endeavor. So one example thread of, of research that, that's happened is, is in, uh, in robot vision. So you here at NVIDIA are very familiar with, with computer vision, um, shape modeling, object recognition, face detection. And there's been a lot of advances in robot vision now as well. Um, but even back you know, 10, 10, 20 years ago, at RoboCup, people were already starting to think of this, this robot vision problem because it, it was a necessity. And to get a sense of it, it's instructive to see what the world looks like through the camera of one of these robot soccer playing robots. Um, frames coming in 30, 30 times a second, the camera bouncing around, it doesn't even see the object of interest at some times, it, and yet it has to figure out where it is, where the ball is, which way to, um, which way to, to kick the ball. And so one of the early advances that we, um, one of my students, Mohan Sridharan, um, 
took, who's now a professor at uh, University of Auckland, was to, uh, to learn a color map. So um, the, uh, usually when you would go out of the lab, you'd take the robot to a new place. They were learning based on the colors of the pixels. Uh, where's the field? Where's the ball? Where's the, the goals? And it would be a very laborious process. It was a supervised learning process. We'd take pictures and paint them and say, this is green, this is white, generalize a function to figure out which pixels map to what thing. But it would take, you know, take hours. And then if the sun went behind, the, behind a cloud or somebody, you know, a light bulb went out, you'd throw up your hands and have to start over again. And so instead, my student Mohan said, well, we could actually have the robot do this itself. So it's learning with, starting with a blank color map, as you'll see sort of on the right here. It knows that it's on a field that's mainly green with white lines, so it can look down and say, well, you know, th those must be the green and white pixels. That's the distribution. And it knows there's a yellow rectangle in front of it, so those pixels must mean yellow. So then it can look left and say, well, I know there's some yellow um, with pink below it, so that must be pink. It can turn around find that though, that rectangle must be blue. It's now got the pixel values for this particular environment in about two and a half minutes of robot time instead of hours of human time. And so, um, and, uh, and then in the end, it's able to use this uh, in real time. This is that same video I showed you before to try to label all of these, um, all of the, the objects that are of interest as it's moving. Now, nowadays, this may not look super impressive, but back in, you know, even 10 years ago, this was before the, the sort of adv recent advances in, in um, computer vision and robot vision. This was a, a really big advance. And so this is where we, um, and then you know, this is sort of just to give you a sense of what things looked like. Um, once we put together, uh, we sent our, some clips to Fox Soccer Channel and they took some artistic liberty. We don't have this kind of fan support at, at RoboCup. But, um, but you can see what happens when we now embed this vision process into a full behavior. They have to, uh, they can't, uh, just do the vision, they have to leave cycles over for the, uh, for the walking, the kicking, the, the communication, the, um, the perception. The soundtrack on here is really funny too, but uh, um, they... Uh, they are hungry for success, and this time it's Lassie. Lassie against Spot But I like this clip here, is that the robot knocks into the goalie, um, and it still knows enough that it's been sort of turned to kick the ball sideways instead of forwards. And so I can show, you know, I can keep showing this. You can find this video on the web. But, um, but that's, uh, you know, the, the point here is that you can't just do that vision problem. You have to do it in a computationally efficient way, enough way that you can embed it in the full behavior. I did, uh, I already showed you, this is the Tower Orange after we won the, the 2012 competition. I showed you that one. We do actually now have humans playing against robots. Every year since 2007, we've had the champions of the middle size league um, play against the robots. Every year it gets a little bit harder. Um, I'm not sure if it's because the robots are getting better or we're getting older, but one way or another, my, you know, this shows that still, um, it looks like when you're just seeing the robots play, like they would just be able to run over us, um, that they move too fast, but then, you know, you put some uh, aging middle-aged, uh, aging um, or middle-aged amateur soccer players on the field and we're still able to pass the ball around the goal. Uh, the robots. They actually called me for offsides there, so that one didn't count. But um, <laughs> in any case, this has motivated a, uh, a research thread that's really gone uh, through my lab since my, my PhD thesis, um, and that's recently um, been reinvigorated in the 3D Simulation League. And that's um, a, uh, a machine learning paradigm known as layered learning. And I want to really emphasize, this is, I think, a very important um, perspective especially in today's world where everybody's talking about pixels to torque and uh, you know, learning end to end. Um, and there's been some really impressive advances in that. And there's you know, things that we never would have imagined that you could do with just a single neural network. Um, and uh, you know, and that, that's been re brought really great progress. But I believe strongly that if we're going to, um, to you know, sort of uh, get to the next level of AI, we're going to need to still um, to use a variety of methods, a variety of techniques, and embrace hierarchy, hierarchical decomposition. It is not everything that you're going to be able to do end to end. And so the philosophy of, of layered learning is that it, uh, it's four domains that are too complex to go straight from states to, uh, from inputs to outputs. And yes, I, I do believe there are still domains of that, that form, and there always will be. Um, it's, uh, it requires hierarchical sub, that a hierarchical subtask decomposition is given. It's actually a nice challenge to try to learn this decomposition, and we have, we're doing a separate thread on that, but for now just assume that it's given. But the idea is that you're using machine learning to exploit data in each of these different layers to train and adapt the behavior 
with the key feature that learning in one layer feeds into the next layer. So for instance, you can imagine getting raw sensor data from the environment to build up a world state, use that to learn individual behaviors, that to learn multi-agent behaviors, and so on up to the high-level goals. So this was introduced back uh, 20 years ago now, um, and it was first applied in the 2D simulation league of robot soccer, where we used um, a neural network, a simple neural network, to, to have an individual agent try to learn how to intercept a ball just by having it move towards it and figure out where, you know, how should it move to try to get to the ball as efficiently as possible. It then used an off-the-shelf decision tree algorithm to do pass evaluation, which was the problem of if I have the ball and I'm going to pass to Bill, um, what's, the, what's the likelihood that he'll successfully intercept that, uh, receive that pass, assuming that both he and all of the other agents around him are using this learned ball interception behavior. So that's the connection between them. And then we introduced a novel reinforcement learning algorithm for pass selection. Given all of these pass evaluations, where should the player pass at any given time? That this led to our team that, that um, with, this is in the finals of the, um, the 1999 2D Simulation League. Our team was in blue. You have to remember each agent here is controlled by a separate, a completely separate process. It's using these learned behaviors. And uh, in that competition, our team ended up um, outscoring the competition uh, 100 and, uh, 110 to 0 over, uh, over 11 games. So this was in the, um, in the 2D competition using layered learning. We then took that to real robots, where we could have the robots learn both fast walking and ball control. On the, on the left, we, had, we have these uh, eyebrows just practicing um, walking, timing themselves, because they know the distance across the field. They can see when, how close they are to the beacon, so they can you know, um, recognize how far they've traveled. And they're experimenting. What happens if I stand up a little taller or move my legs a little bit faster within a, policy, a parameterized policy space? And after um, about 1,000 trials walking back and forth, so in about three hours, while the students were just you know, working on the paper or going out to lunch or whatever, the robot's doing this all entirely on their own, we ended up with a walk that was 15% faster than anybody else had been able to hand code on these robots. Um, and then we took that behavior and used it as input to a ball control behavior, where the robot was learning to pinch the ball under its chin, again, experimenting on its own with a parameterized control policy. And this was a form of policy gradient reinforcement learning that was being used. So this layered learning, so layered learning approach started with just two possible paradigms. Actually, it started with just this one, the sequential layered learning, where you learn one behavior, freeze it, and then learn the second one. But quickly, people said, well, but what about what happens if you learn in that second behavior that makes something that makes it that the first behavior should, have, should change? And so that led to the introduction of concurrent layered learning, where you would learn one behavior and then keep, um, keep adapting the, the, uh, the first layer while you're learning the second. But the, each of these has problems, right? So the first sequential is, is a little bit limiting. The second concurrent layered learning increases the dimensionality of the learning problem, so it makes it that you need more examples. Um, but using these two paradigms, there were a bunch of different sort of successful applications of layered learning with roughly three to four layers. Um, and that went on for about 10 or 15 years or so until, uh, until recently, um, about five years ago, my student Patrick McAlpine and I started applying this to a new problem, the 3D Simulation League at RoboCop, and it introduced um, overlapping layered learning, which, which offers different trade-offs between these, these two extremes. In particular, um, combining independently learned behaviors, where the two, uh, two behaviors are learned separately, and then some parameters are left open to try to learn the seam between them. Partial concurrent layered learning, which is sort of as it's described here, or previously learned layer refinement, where you can sort of alternate back and forth between the two. Um, we just had a journal article accepted at AI, uh, AIJ, the AI journal, uh, just two days ago, actually, that describes all of the details of this. Um, and, uh, and then we applied this in the RoboCup 3D Simulation League. And this has really been where we've been, uh, uh, been a great challenge domain for us over the past years, where there's teams of 11 robots on each, uh, each team using a realistic physics uh, engine, um, I mean realistic in quotes, it's not fully realistic, but it's open, open dynamics engine, models gravity and, and all of the joints of these robots. Um, a simulated robot that's modeled after the real robot that we use. Um, the robots get noisy visual information about the environment and they can communicate over a noisy um, low bandwidth communication channel. So this is just to get a sense of what the simulation looks like. This was, um, uh, you know, they have to, they, just getting them to stand up without falling over is a challenge in and of itself. Getting them to, uh, to walk robustly. So our team was in blue here. Um, this was, this is, uh, um, back in 2011, we actually learned 
a, a robust enough walk that we could score all of our goals just by walking the ball into the goal. We never passed the ball ever and ended up winning the, winning the competition because we used a machine learning method um, to learn a better walk than anybody else. And both that, that applied in 2011 and 2012. The way we did this was by starting from our walk that we programmed on the real robot. So this is the only example I know of actually where somebody used the real world to help um, improve a simulation rather than the other way around. But um, it started with a parameterized um, double linear inverted pendulum model. So what that means is that we have a model of the robot um, having its center of, uh, having the one foot act as the fulcrum of an inverted pendulum, swinging its center of mass over that fulcrum, and then landing on another, on its uh, second foot as the, for the double support phase, and then that becomes a second pendulum and it can then swing its uh, center of mass over that. When, and uh, when you, when you um, encode a walk in this way, though, it leaves a whole bunch of open parameters, right? How big should the step size be? How much should the center of mass sway from left to right as the robot's moving? How fast should it move through each of these cycles? There's, there's dozens of parameters. And um, typically what, they, what teams did is they would hand code the parameters. They say, well, let's try tweaking that one up down, a little bit or that one down a little bit. Very laborious. Instead, we took a, uh, a machine learning approach, a form of policy gradient reinforcement learning known as uh, CMAES, which is not our own algorithm, but we applied it here. That's basically a stochastic derivative free numerical optimization method where it's sort of a population or generational approach. Um, it's not technically a genetic algorithm because it's not randomly searching through the space. It's more of a deliberative um, process for trying to figure out how to um, to figure out what to sample in the next generation. So basically, it samples candidates from a multi-dimensional ga Gaussian. In each, um, at each step, it analyzes, it comes up with a new distribution such that the mean of that distribution would maximize the likelihood of the best performing policies in the previous generation, and the covariance updates control the search step size. And so then, through a series of, of um, sort of uh, evaluations, it converges to a local optimum. There's no guarantee that this will converge to a global optimum. But in practice, it worked very well. We started with this um, initial walk, where the, uh, this was ported directly from our, um, from our real robot, so, and uh, just put it straight into the simulator, and it worked. Right? It's stable, it's slow, it's a little bit lumbering, it's not going to get us very far in the simulation league. And the story was actually back in 2010, my students started applying this CMAES algorithm and came to me one day and said, we're going to win. There's no, no uh, we're, our robots are running twice as fast as anybody else. The, this learning algorithm works great. There's a, you know, all we have to do is embed it in a behavior. And so we said, okay, well, let's try to embed it in a behavior. We can get this really fast walk. The problem was um, it would start, you know, it start in our slow walk, then we'd, we'd change to the fast walk. And then when it wanted to slow down to do something with the ball, this is what would happen. And so then we had to you know, sort of say, oh, OK, well, let's, let's try to slow down, change the parameters. And all of a sudden, we were going back to s slower than everybody else again and back to the drawing board. So this is where layered learning came in. We started learning these different behaviors together in, con you know, in conjunction with one another. Things like um, now the sprint and the go to target behavior, it would learn one. And then once it had learned one, it would try to learn the other one so that it wouldn't fall over as it transitioned between the two. And so this is what layered learning allowed us to do. And then we could add in a third layer in where it was trying to use those previous um, two behaviors and now add a position one that would get it behind the ball to try to uh, dribble the ball as quickly as possible. And so using layered learning in this way, we ended up with a walk that was now, um, you, should, you know, should, should recognize this as being significantly faster than the one we started with. And this is the one that allowed us to, to win those 2011 and 12 competitions without ever, uh, without ever passing, because we had just a, a, much more, a much quicker and robust walk. But of course, the way the competition works, we publish our results, we release our code, our binaries, and people can practice against it. And so by 2013, all the teams had sort of caught up, and we were back to the drawing board. We're not going to be able to win using that method anymore. And so this is where overlapping layered learning came in. We said, OK, we're going to have to start learning to kick, to pass, to get up, to do all these different things. And so now, instead of just three or four learned behaviors, we ended up with 19 different learned behaviors using all of these different types of overlapping layered learning with over 500 parameters optimized. You don't have to understand all the numbers in this diagram. I'll just give you a couple of cross sections um, of the kinds of things that were learned. So for instance, approaching a ball to kick it was just you know, the task of trying to get into position to, to get so that you could kick it. Um, we could then separately learn uh, a kick. So just have the robot um, practice kicking the ball as far as it can. 
And, um, but without having to worry about getting into position. So we just put it in the right position. It would practice over and over again. And then to combine those two together, we'd use overlapping layered learning so that it could then learn the, you know, start now walking up to the ball and kicking it and sort of refining those to the, some of the parameters of both of those behaviors as it was doing it. And then that led us to um, the ability not just to dribble the ball into the ball, uh, to the goal all the time, but instead to be able to walk up to it and at a certain distance approach and then, um, and then kick from distance into the goal. So um, the other one that I just like to show is an undergraduate in the lab said, well, you know, we ought to be able to now score from a kickoff, right? So, you know, the, we should just be able to um, have the ball bounce at the right place and go over the goalie. Um, cause, and so that's sort of what happens there. Um, of course, those of you who know the rules of soccer, uh, so, you know, you can't score directly off of a kickoff, and the student said, oh, that's no problem. We'll just have the, uh, a second robot learn to um, touch the ball a little bit, um, as little as possible, so that the other one can then uh, score into the goal. So that was a, a, a learned behavior. The problem was if you don't use layered learning to put those together, you get a, bloop, a blooper video, which I promise we didn't script. Um, we just put those two together without the layered learning. One of them tried to uh, touch the ball. The other one tried to kick the ball. And uh, the second one apparently became very frustrated. We didn't kill the robots in time. And uh, yeah, this is what happened. Um, but then if we, um, we use layered learning, you can see sort of the inside of here. They can adapt again these skills so that what the first robot can barely touch the ball. The second one can move it over. And then uh, we can score off the kickoff. And uh, so we didn't, um, we didn't reveal this until the, till the finals of the competition in 2014. Um, and so one second into the game, we were winning one nothing and never turned back from there. Um, one of the advantages of this approach is that we can repeat it if the robot body changes, right? So we have the standard now, but now we could have one with longer legs or quicker moving legs or added toes to the, to the feet, any of these. Um, and we can now compare, you know, with all of those different types, we can play against the, the champions from the, or the best teams from the previous year and show that in all cases, these numbers are just uh, numbers of goals scored on average in a 10-minute in a game against those teams. Um, it was able to learn uh, to do well. But there's a lot of computation going on here. And this is, you know, this kind of approach to, to machine learning is something where I think, you know, um, NVIDIA can play a big role as well. You know, there, there were 700,000 parameter sets evaluated for, for each of these experiments. If we did this on a single computer, it would take uh, 1.5 years um, using our uh, Condor cluster that Steve has, has a big role of getting into our, uh, into our department. Um, we were able to, you know, relearn a new behavior in about a couple of days. But it's still, you know, very computationally intensive to do this. Um, oops, uh, I didn't mean to do that. Um, Where was I? Um, so uh, just to, you know, where, where we got by RoboCup 2014, we ended up outscoring the opponents 52 to nothing. But you play, you know, each game once, we then go, can go back to the lab and try 1,000 games against each of the opponents. It, and we could find that it wasn't a fluke. We would never have lost a game if we played 1,000 games against anybody. There were a few ties. Um, but uh, we won all 11,000 games. Um, and. Uh, one all but 67. And uh, you know, here's what the highlights looked like then. Um, here's that kickoff right at the beginning of the, uh, of the game where our robot touched it and, uh, um, and scored immediately. But then you also see goals like this one, where the other team had a kickoff. Our robot was able to move out to it. There's a whole thread of this research on multi-agent systems that I'm not talking about on where should the robots be, how should they coordinate, and how should they pass. Those are the kinds of goals we scored in that competition. We then repeated. Um, successfully defended the championship in 2015 and 2016. And then just last month, um, the student is now graduating. So this may be our last, uh, the last uh, hurrah in this competition. But we ended up winning the, the competition, one, uh, 171, scoring 171 goals and giving up zero. And there's a really fun, um, uh, oops, that's the wrong. Oh, I don't have the 2017 highlights uh, here. I have the, uh, just the other ones. But anyway, it's, it's, start, it's starting to look a lot more um, like there's a lot more passing and a lot more varied kicking um, that's going on in these leagues now. And so goals are being seen a lot more like this, where there's a great save by the goalie and our robot's able to come up and, uh, and score from an angle. Um, in any case, you can get a lot more details at our, uh, at our web page here. So just. Uh, this, of course, leads to, so this has been a really big, um, you know, sort of a big thread of research for us. But of course, there's the question, you've learned all this in simulation, does it help the real world at all? And the answer initially is no, 
The simulator is not good enough. The, the robot is learning to optimize for the simulation. These behaviors that we learn in simulation um, just don't work if we, if we take them back to the real world. The robot falls over after two steps. But, um, and so this has motivated a new thread of research, my student Josiah Hanna, on grounded simulation learning. And I, I'm, um, I could give a, you know, another half hour talk on this. I don't have time for it. But just in one slide, what's going on is we, we learn in simulation. So we do this policy improvement in simulation. We take that improved policy and execute it in the real world. And then we get from the same policy that's executed in the real world and in simulation, we get some trajectories. Those trajectories can be represented as um, state action next state tuples. And, um, and then we can throw this into a neural network. And this is, we have a, so we have a, a deep learning component to this, uh, to this thread of research, where we can um, learn a forward model of the simulator, or sort of a forward model of the real world, which means if I'm in this state and I take this action, what state would I end up in next? And we can learn an inverse model of the simulator, which says if I want to end up in this state and I'm in this state, what action should I take? So that we can now retune the simulator so that when we're in a state, we take an action that leads to the same transition we would have had in the real world. And so this is the grounding process. And this is sort of, we do a uh, sort of a two-stage neural network for, um, for doing this with several hidden layers in between. Um, and if we do that incrementally, we can reground the simulator. Um, and it's really, it's implemented as basically every action that comes out of the simulator gets transformed into the action that you should send to the real world to get the effect you would get had you run it on the real robot. So that's the grounding function. We can then re-improve the policy and simulation, reapply in the real world, and repeat. And this doesn't lead to a, a globally better simulator, but it leads to a simulator that's more accurate in the part of the search space that you're currently searching um, in simulation. And so using this method, we started with a state-of-the-art walk that, worked at, uh, that, that moved at 19.3 centimeters per second on the, on the now robot. It was one developed by the University of New South Wales, and they made their code available. Um, and so this was the walk that, that was basically the fastest walk, uh, stable walk known on the now at the time. After one iteration of this grounded simulation learning, we got a walk that was 34% uh, faster um, and sort of learned to lower its center of gravity. It's moving now 26.3 centimeters per second. This was already the fastest known stable walk on that robot at that time. And then we went another iteration through this process and ended up with a, with a walk that's 28 centimeters per second. So this is the fastest known walk on the stable walk on this robot. And of course, everybody who participates in RoboCup is trying to make faster walks. There is a caveat here. We can't use this in the competition because um, the robot's not taking into account overheating on the joints. If it walks like this for too long, the robot overheats and then starts falling over all the time. So we were just optimizing for the, this short walk. Um, but nonetheless, from this perspective of can you get a walking controller to walk as fast as possible, this was a, a very nice way of, of closing the loop and going from the, sim from the real world to simulation and then back. Um, so like I said, and there, there's a whole bunch of other related re research here on off-policy evaluation. My student who's working on this, uh, Josiah Hanna, has been um, doing a whole bunch of great work in this space. So for the part that I've talked about so far, I really should acknowledge, of course, I didn't do all of this myself. I should acknowledge um, my uh, student, Patrick McAlpine, who's the one who did the 3D Simulation League, Josiah Hanna, who did this grounded simulation learning. But I've talked about work that many other of the students in my lab over the years have contributed to um, in their time. Uh, and then, of course, there's been a lot of, uh, lot of sponsorship from various government agencies and industry, industry partners. Uh, NVIDIA is not on the list yet, but maybe, uh, maybe in the future. Um, so I promised I'd also, before finishing this talk, sort of take a step back and, and give sort of a bigger picture. Um, and uh, you know, that, that gives you, a, a hopefully, a good sense of the kind of research that I'm interested in and what's going on in my lab. Um, but looking, looking forward, I had the opportunity to, be, um, to chair a study panel that released a report about um, a year ago now um, about AI and life in, in 2030. And, um, so to it, it's, uh, it was the, uh, the one, it's part of the AI 100 study, the 100-year study on artificial intelligence, um, where we were challenged uh, to, um, to predict roughly what would be the likelihood of, of, what would be the likely changes or impacts of AI on a typical North American city by the year 2030. Now this, I, I could give another full talk on this, 
But instead, I'm just going to sort of give you a quick overview of what we, the kinds of questions we examined here. And you know, maybe this, in addition to the talk um, on my own research, will seed some of the discussion that happens afterwards. So for those of you who don't know, the idea of the 100-year study, uh, it was an endowment given by Eric Horvitz, Eric and Mary Horvitz, um, to, uh, to Stanford with the idea of to, uh, to support a longitudinal study of the influences of AI um, advances on people in society, centering on periodic studies um, of the developments, trends, and futures, and potential disruptions associated with developments in machine intelligence. And also to think about what kind of proactive efforts we could take to make sure that the impacts of AI um, are more positive than negative on the world. Um, this started actually back with a, a presidential panel when, when Eric and Bart Selman were the um, led, when Eric was the president of AAAI, a bunch of us gathered at Asilomar and thought about these issues, but then it turned into this AI 100 study. There's a standing committee, um, but the way it works is that they're going to have uh, every five years a study panel that the standing committee invites. This time uh, there was just one panel chair, that was me. Um, I invited a bunch of panelists, and then this is going to continue on every five years for at least 100 years. And the endowment's actually set up so it actually can go much beyond that at this point. Um, but the idea is to convey results um, and sort of about the state of the art of AI to uh, four different uh, audiences. And the charge we were given, it's going to be a different charge for each of the study panels, but we were given to the charge to identify possible advances in AI over the next 15 years and their potential influences on daily life, um, specifying the engineering and legal efforts needed to realize these developments, and to uh, think about the policy issues. But we were given the focusing device of thinking just about large urban areas in a typical first world country, or North American, uh, North American city, um, which basically scoped out military um, implications of AI, and, uh, and uh, you know, sort of some of the issues that would come up in third world countries or in rural, uh, rural settings. But the idea is that in, this, in these large urban areas, there'd be potential influences on a wide variety of activities, interdependencies, and interactions among these AI technologies. Um, the uh, study panel, these are the people on the study panel. Many, most, the idea here was to collect people who are um, knowledgeable about AI, who've been working in, in the field for, for uh, many years. It's got a, uh, a diversity of, of uh, gender and geography and area within AI. But really in response, that everybody's writing about AI, but not everybody has the uh, credentials to be writing about AI. And so this was trying to give a view from the inside of what are the realistic possible benefits of AI technologies, also the realistic risks, and what are the barriers between getting from where we are now to realizing the benefits, and trying to be as balanced as possible. Um, the feedback I've gotten, you know, some people have said that we ended up still tilting a little bit too much on the, uh, on the um, positive side. But uh, I assigned this as the reading assignment for my intro AI class this semester, and one of the students ran a sentiment analysis, and we came out really pretty close to zero on the uh, positive-negative sentiment. So I was, was happy to hear that. Um, uh, actually, I didn't want to be sh I'm showing the wrong deck here. I don't need to show all of this. But the, um, the, uh, the structure of the report, and I encourage you to go read it, it was we actually used a professional writer to help us really uh, end up crafting the prose so that it could be uh, accessible to the general public. It's got a three-layer hierarchical structure. So, you know, there's a, a one-page executive summary. So if you really don't have time, here's the executive summary. You can, you know, you have time to read this. Um, and uh, then it's got a five-page overview, which goes into a little more detail. And then it dives into the, um, the report itself, defining AI, current research trends, um, AI by domain in eight different areas of likely urban impact. And in each of them, we look back 15 years, what's happened in the past 15 years, and looked forward. And a big theme of this report is that AI is not one thing. AI is a collection of different technologies, and, it's, and it's th those technologies can be brought to bear in different ways in each of these different um, domains, and should therefore also be regulated or be you know, sort of approached by regulatory agencies differently in each of these domains as well. Um, so as I said, we looked at the opportunities, barriers, and realistic risks. We also talked about policy and legal issues, uh, and made, talked about the current status of the regulatory framework and making recommendations. And again, if you don't have, uh, you know, if you want to get the quick view all the way through, there's um, call-outs in the margins like, you know, like this one. Society is now at a crucial juncture, juncture in determining how to deploy AI-based technologies in ways that promote rather than hinder democratic values such as freedom, equality, and transparency. Um, so you can get a sense by looking through those. But just the, those eight domains that we looked at are the, these here. Um, 
the least controversial, you know, probably transportation. Everyone knows there's disruption going on there, but also looked at home and service robots, healthcare, education. Each of these have sort of different characteristics, relying on hardware, partnering with people, building trust, um, interpersonal interactions. And uh, I'm not going to go through this. I don't. I want. Uh, I want to close in a minute. Um, but you know. Uh, in each of these, we talk about the transformations from a data perspective, predictive models, and decision models, and have um, you know, sort of conclusions like transportation may be the first domain where the public's asked to trust AI on a large scale, um, and, uh, and look at uh, different developments there. In healthcare, um, we, we uh, say that AI-based applications could improve health outcomes for millions of people, but only if they gain the trust of doctors, nurses, and patients, and then talk about how can we uh, promote this kinds of trust, um, and what are the what are some of the uh, the risks involved as well, um, and uh, and then we look a lot at the employment and workplace, um, concluding that we think in the near term AI technology will replace more tasks than jobs, um, but also that it is not too soon for social debate on how the economic and this is sort of the tongue in cheek quote how the uh, economic fruits of AI technology should be shared as children in traditional societies support their aging parents, perhaps our artificially intelligent children should support us, the parents of their intelligence. But you know, the idea being that, that we really, you know, the, the gap, we don't think that jobs are going to go away, but the gap between rich and poor may widen, and we need to be proactive about thinking about that. And then we talk about policy and legal issues um, and some recommendations that I'm, uh, I can come back to if there are questions. Um, I guess the three big, big recommendations were defining a path towards accruing technical expertise in AI at all levels of government, removing perceived and actual impediments to research on the fairness, security, privacy, and social impacts of AI systems, and increasing public and private funding for it, uh, interdisciplinary studies of societal impacts of AI. Um, so in any case, that's a, that was a whirlwind through that. I do highly encourage you to look at that report. We've gotten a lot of really, really great feedback on it. Um, I'd be interested in your, in your views. But with that, um, you know, the main theme of this talk was um, introducing you to my research in reinforcement learning, where I think that the current state of the art is in reinforcement learning, how we're using it in, uh, in research in my lab, in particular giving you a snapshot into robot skill learning from real world to simulation and back. And, uh, and with that, I'll be more than happy to take questions.